be um, uh, actually this talk and the next talk uh, by Helena will be talking to you about uh, Apache Spark. Uh, mine is more of an introduction, um, starting at the Scala Collections API that you all know and love, and uh, talking about how Scala is really a scalable language. You can start from uh, doing collections transformations on a few items to all the way to distributed uh, big data uh, stuff. And the next talk is more about um, streaming and kind of like a big data pipeline. So they'll both be pretty interesting. Um, huh. All right, well, sorry, you have to bear with the color a little bit. Um, let me see if we can make that a little better. Um, all right, well, all right. Let's, uh, let's keep going and hopefully the text will be more readable in subsequent slides. Anyway, um, so again, my name is uh, Evan Chan. I am the principal engineer at uh, Socrata. And uh, I've been working in with um, Hadoop, Spark, Cassandra, Kafka, and various um, big data systems for a number of years. And that's uh, what, I, what I love to, uh, to do. Um, a little bit about uh, Socrata. I'm very blessed to represent uh, Socrata today. We built software to make data uh, open data, public data, more accessible to, to you, uh, the citizens. And what does that mean? Um, how many people here are from Seattle? Awesome. Uh, great city. How many people are from San Francisco Bay Area? All right. Um, so both, both Seattle, uh, San Francisco, uh, and various counties in California, um, they're all like our customers. So we help you guys figure out how uh, your city, your county, your state, the US federal government is spending your money. Um, and are they meeting certain goals? Uh, governments nowadays are really into opening up their data. They want citizens to engage because that results in more, uh, you know, better informed voters and so forth. Um, we also expose really interesting data sets such as how much are medical procedures being charged around the country? Is your doctor being bribed by pharmaceutical companies? And, you know, how many free lunches are they getting? That kind of thing. Um, a lot of uh, really awesome stuff. And we also sponsor hackathons. Our entire back end, back end is in Scala. Um, now, a really interesting um, story, this is true. Last year, I was um, sitting in your chair, coming to this conference for the first time. Uh, I had not heard about Socrata, and I heard, um, it was now my colleague Clint come up and give a talk. And it, I was like, oh, this is you know really interesting. Uh, this is really interesting. We are. Um, this is a company that's uh, using Scala in backend, but it's also uh, you know, trying to change the world. And now I'm here you know, working for them. <laughs> so <laughs> I um, you know, want to encourage you guys, you know, if you, you, know, if you uh, feel like uh, you want to do something really, really interesting um, in, in a sense of not only technical, but also in terms of uh, helping to, to change uh, the way that our government works um, and uh, enable you know, a better country, uh, come talk to me or come talk to the rest of us who are over at that booth. But um, anyway, enough about um, me and Socrata. We're here to talk about Scala. Now, why do you guys love Scala so much? Can one or two things. Anybody? Almost Haskell. Almost Haskell, all right. <laughs> <laughs> Almost Haskell, you can use like as many symbols as you want. Uh, well, that, I guess that's one reason. Um, so, I like to think that uh, one, uh, some reasons, uh, my favorite reasons are the concurrency, the Java interop, you know, functional programming. But I think one really key thing uh, is the collections API, being able to work with uh, lists and maps and do all kinds of functional transformations on them is uh, pretty powerful. And you don't realize how good it is until you uh, compare it to a lot of other languages, how complete uh, the Scala collections is the fact that you can work with both mutable and immu immutable data structures pretty easily. Um, they're great because it makes working with data a, a joy. Uh, you can easily go from um, sequential to, to parallel to distributed. When we talk about Scala, scalable language, uh, this is one key thing that you know you can. The same API as you'll see, you can go from small data sets to uh, doing parallel operations on them to doing like. I don't know, like huge data volumes. So um, let's look at a really simple example, just uh, doing a map on the, on the list. Uh, I think everyone is pretty familiar with this. We're, we're calling, uh, having a list of numbers, 
and we're calling the map function, and the function is taking the item and multiplying by two, and you get back the answer right away. You know, pretty, pretty simple. How does this really work? So the source code here is from the Scala standard library, it's from the trait traversable like. And you can see that there's something called can build from. Basically the first item is that uh, it calls builder and uh, builds a new collection. Then it's gonna use a for loop, it's gonna go through uh, all the items in the um, original list and apply this function f of x and ap append that item to the list and then it gives it back to you. And you can see that this is uh, sequential, right? So. Anyway, that's the Scala source code. Uh, does it have to be sequential? Well, actually, no. So if we think about it, mapping is, uh, is an inherently parallelizable operation. Um, you know, pretty easy to split up and apply the function in parallel. So starting in Scala 2.10, uh, there's uh, this feature called parallel collections. How many of you guys have used have, or tried out this parallel collections thing? Cool, uh, maybe like a fourth of you. Uh, very convenient, I can just add four characters dot par, and that turns my list into a, a par seek or something like that. And it gives you back a par seek, or actually a par vector. And what it does is it does a divide and conquer, it'll split up the list into a magic number of uh, splits, and um, apply the map algorithm in, in serial. Uh, speaking of uh, divide and conquer, this is uh, supposed to be an image of ants, all right? You can't really see it. But, um, the, you know, nature has been really good at divide and conquer for a long time. But anyway, just... Uh, what else can be easily parallelized? So, uh, things like filter for each, you know, all pretty easy. What about group by? Group by is a little bit harder, right? You need to actually uh, transfer things back and forth. There's some, you know, shuffle going on. So we've gone from um, single-threaded to parallel. What about distributed? So this is where I introduced Apache Spark. How many folks have not heard of Spark? Wow, okay, all right. That's, um, uh, I'll just go through this really quickly. The audience is uh, probably uh, fairly familiar, uh, but how many people are actually using Spark in, in their jobs? That's actually pretty good too, kind of. So, so Apache Spark is a horizontally scalable in-memory uh, in computation engine. It's like Hadoop, but much better. Um, how is it better? It gives you a significantly better uh, a functional Scala API. It has a REPL, so you can try things out. In terms of productivity, it is like completely different. There's a slide that I didn't bring in, but basically a uh, word count in Hadoop is like 60 lines, you know, and, and you could easily do it in one line. Um, if you want like the long one-liners we were talking about earlier, if you, if you want nice looking Scala, it's still only like three lines, maybe. Uh, and it has a huge amount of momentum right now. It's like probably by far the most active um, big data project and one of the most active Apache projects overall. Uh, has just about everyone is trying to plug their data store or framework or whatever into Spark and um, it has a lot of components that are being built on top. So it's not only like MapReduce style batch jobs, but there's a streaming component, there's an SQL uh, layer, uh, there's graph algorithms, machine learning. So a lot of really, really neat stuff is being built on top. So let's go back to our example. We want to have a list of items, we want to do some mapping function over it. So this is what a distributed map looks like with Spark. It's, it's um, pretty much the same code we have We'll, we'll go into what this, is, what this means, this RDD thing, but we have a map function. Again, it's the same function, it's underscore times two. Uh, I just added a tick to it, which as you'll see is necessary to get the results back. Um, but now you can map and filter on paired up bytes of data with the exact same syntax. So what is really going on under the hood? Um, so, the basic abstraction in Spark is called an RDD, which stands for a Resilient Distributed Data Set. And this is basically a distributed immutable collection of items. And RDD is split into partitions. And the rule is that one partition has to fit entirely onto one node. One node can contain multiple partitions, but a partition can never be split amongst uh, nodes. 
Uh, and an RDD is typed just like a standard Scala collection is. So you can have an RDD of ints, just like in Scala you have a seek of ints. Functions that return, uh, for example, line input that read from a whole bunch of files will give you, for example, an RDD of string. Uh, and if you had something else, for example, like you read from Cassandra, you might get a case class by Acker. So, so you know, depending on you know, uh, what, what you're trying to do. Right. Um, so under the hood, this is a little bit hard to see, I apologize, but um, basically uh, you have an RDD of numbers uh, the text in the first boxes read one, two, and then n. And what we what we do is that we produce a uh, new RDD with each item mapped uh, uh, with the mapping function. And this is all just done uh, in parallel. So you imagine all the different nodes are running running the mapping um, in parallel. So this is pretty um, easy to understand. Hope. Uh, so, uh, just some notes on terminology. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Is the partition stuff you have to decide up front and can it change during runtime? Or? Uh, that's a good question. So the question was, is the partition decided um, up front? You, uh, it depends um, when you, a lot of functions will um, give you a default for the number of partitions. Um, for example, like the simple function to parallelize a, a sequential list, uh, the default is the number of cores that you have, uh, which usually isn't what you want. Um, if you're reading from, say, HDFS or Cassandra, um, Hadoop has a notion of partitioning based on how many nodes you have, how many blocks in HDFS. So then that gets decided for you. Uh, you can, however, after you have a, an RDD, you can decide to um, repartition into a different number of partitions if you want. And subsequent operations, usually some of them will, anything that shuffles over the network, a lot of them will allow you to configure the number of resulting partitions if, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so a Spark worker node, actually there are two uh, uh, processes, actually a worker and executor, but that's where the computations are run and the results of the data cached. A Spark driver is, is your application, um, there isn't any equivalent in Hadoop, but basically uh, it's, it's your main app that uh, actually executes, that has the um, functionality like rdd.map and that kind of thing. So that controls the program flow and executes the steps. Um, and in this case, when we run a tick, that takes the items that have been computed and returns it from the worker nodes to the driver, so the network transfer happens. And Spark will actually take your functions in Scala and serialize them over the network. So, so one requirement is that uh, mapping functions need to be network serializable. This is a really quick overview of Spark API. So there are some APIs that work within a data set, like uh, map filter, group by, sample. There are some join operators that work across uh, RDDs. Um, there are some actions, we'll go a little bit more into those, that give you results in general. And then there's some other optimization. Someone was asking about repartitioning. So for example, there's a repartition function that allows you to change a number of partitions. So this is supposed to be an image of Homer lying down on the sofa <laughs> with donuts. I love donuts, by the way. How many people have gone to Voodoo Donuts in Portland? It's a few. All right, cool. But, for every person that likes them, there's always like some hometown donut shop that they, they prefer. Anyway, um, we're talking about laziness in Scala collections and how that imply, uh, applies to Spark. So when we did my list.map, that returned a new collection right away, right? What about uh, streams and iterators? What happens if we take a list, convert to a stream, and we apply a map to it? We'll see that when we apply a map to a stream, it doesn't you know, give us the values right away. It gives us a new stream. Uh, well, you can actually see that the first value has changed. That gets mapped. But the subsequent values are not. There's still a question mark. So um, this basically, a stream is lazy. right? A computation is not done until you ask for the results. Uh, so in this case, in order to get the result, I actually am converting it to a list. Even when I do a tick on a 
stream, you still get a new stream and you don't get the result yet. So how does this work under the hood? <coughs> so this is the um, implementation of streams map method from the standard library. Uh, you can see that it has this line called cons. Um, and so what it does is it maps the first element, but then returns a stream of the tail of the list, which is all the other elements in the stream, uh, with this mapping function. So what happens in, um, in the lazy collection is, is that the key is that the tail is not evaluated. And uh, instead, it remembers the step, the transformation that you applied. So you see it, it's, what you have is a new object that uh, contains the composition of the function f uh, with the previous stream. And so you can imagine that if you take more and more transformations, you start to have a, um, a history, if you will, of the steps that you took to build up that. And, but nothing actually happens until you actually evaluate the tail. By the way, does anyone know the difference between streams and iterators? I just you know, threw this in. But um, both streams and iterators are lazy. Uh, streams memoize the results, so you have to be careful about memory usage. But the key thing is iterators are, are mutable and have state, and you can only use them once. Once you've iterated through an iterator one time, then, then that's it, right? Then, then they're, they're done. A stream can be reused. There is also something else uh, called an iterable, which can give you an iterator again and again. So if you need to reuse an iterator, you might want to return an iterable instead. Anyway, slight detour. So what about laziness as it applies to Spark? Well, let's say that I do a map operation. And by the way, let me preface this bit of code with the Spark context are parallelized. Uh, if you don't know Spark, this is uh, the easiest way to, this is the way to take a uh, sequence that you have and convert it into an RDD. So this is, you see this a lot. Um, could be anything like so just test data to, I don't know, the list of text files you want to read from or whatever, right? Um, so after Spark conducts are parallelized, you get an RDD. And the map is being applied to the RDD. You can see the result of that mapping uh, is that I get back a mapped RDD. I don't get back the mapped results. So, so what this tells you is that Spark uh, is also lazy. And just like the way that streams work, Spark is also remembering that you did this transformation, a mapping of a function, and is remembering that in what it calls um, a lineage. And so Spark will remember every step that you took. So, so I have a mapped RDD. What am I going to do with it? So this is where the actions come in. So uh, an action is, for example, count. So let's say that I've done, let's say res6 represents a bunch of transformations. When I do count, that actually forces the work to happen and Spark will actually go through. So let's say that you're reading from Hadoop files. Until you do count, no IO actually occurs at all. It's only, until, it's only when you do count or collect that um, the IO and the transformations all happen. Count is a pretty popular way to force a computation in Spark, by the way. So. Um, so why is laziness important for Spark? So there's a number of, um, a lot of reasons. F first reason is perhaps that uh, for when you have a huge amount of data, uh, you want to, sh to minimize the amount of work that has to be done. If I do a tick, for example, I don't need to go through uh, every uh, IO source and uh, apply my transformation, expensive transformation to every bit of data. I just need to do the minimum necessary to return the first end results. Uh, you would use up, you end up using a lot less memory for intermediate results because instead of creating a new RDD at every point, I can apply the composition of a whole bunch of functions um, at once. Um, and what's more, the Spark can optimize and does optimize the, the execution plan. So if you have a whole bunch of map and filter map-like stages where the work is all local to a partition, it will combine all of them and execute them together. Uh, so Spark will try to optimize uh, things so that you know, it can run as many things together as possible. Uh, and lastly, which is a really important reason, is uh, that for every recovery, uh, the reason why Spark remembers all of your steps is that if something goes wrong when you're computing, 
I mean, let's say that you lose an, a node or you lose part of your data. Then what's the way that uh, Spark recovers from error is that it retraces those steps. Uh, so one assumption that Spark makes is that you're starting from a source which is redundant and you can read from uh, again. So for, uh, for example, uh, do distributed file system or something like that. So it can go back and read that source data and recompute the steps to get back your computation. Now, um, obviously, if you had to read, uh, if you wanted to repeat some calculation and you had to read something from disk again and again, this is very expensive. And the key to Spark Speed is actually being able to cache data and memory. So there's a cache function. It will save the, la the results of the last bit of data um, so that you can reuse it again and again. And if we have time, I'll demo, uh, I'll demo this at the, at the, at the very end. Um, and it, it's like memoization. It gives you like between one or two orders of magnitude speed up uh, because you can uh, do um, because you can just read from memory. And it is used a lot for iterative algorithms, especially such as linear regression, that kind of thing. This is where you see a, a, a really really huge boost in performance of Hadoop. There are many ways of caching data in Spark. Um, the <coughs> default one is to memory, but you can actually um, serialize to memory and disk. Uh, you can also use an experimental off-heap mode, which is pretty cool if you want to have a redundancy and survive uh, worker node failures. And finally, there's a Spark SQL. Um, some of you might have heard of Shark, which is, was the old Spark SQL layer, but um, Spark SQL now is, is replacing Shark. They're not doing new development on uh, Shark anymore. Uh, Spark SQL has a very different kind of caching. The default caching uses a serialization, like such as Java serialization, and it keeps those uh, the values of your RDD in memory. Spark SQL actually has a compressed uh, columnar uh, in memory kind of um, caching where that takes values and compresses them um, using techniques like dictionary compression. And so it can, it uses a lot less memory than um, something like Java serialization would, uh, and it's a lot faster. It's built for, it's built for fast SQL queries. Is there a specific I mean, I think it depends on uh, the use case. Um, I mean, if, if you're using SQL, then obviously the, the SQL caching makes sense. But for the other ones, uh, it depends on what, like, if you prefer, like, for example, replicated uh, is a you know pretty good strategy if you don't want to rebuild your data uh, from from scratch, you know. So, um, or Tachyon, for that matter. I, th I think especially as more and more people um, are thinking about uh, multi-tenancy, uh, they want to run uh, multiple applications uh, to query the same set of data, as well as to survive, you know, let's say my worker node runs out of memory or whatever. Uh, then something like Tachyon, which is an off-heap cache for your data, starts to become more and more appealing. So I think there's a lot of work around that area now. Uh, yeah, quick question. <laughs> Uh, that's a good question. So how long does a cached data live? Um, so Spark has a built-in feature called a TTL. Uh, so I think by default it's off. I'm actually not, don't remember what, I'm not sure what the default is now, but you can configure it. So you can say that I want my data to live for 12 hours. And then after the 12 hours is over, Spark will start cleaning up uh, old references um, and things that it thinks are not being used. So, so that's how you control the, how long it lives. So grouping and sorting, you know, this is where it gets pretty interesting. So let's look at how do we do a top K word count in Scala, right? I have a bunch of words uh, from somewhere. You know, I want to find out the top five words. So uh, what do we do is we do a group by by itself. This gives me a map of each unique word to all the instances of that word. And I'm going to convert that into a count of each word. Then I'm going to sort it and just take the top five items. I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah, that was a lot of math. Sorry, I, I'm not a math person, so, you know. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm just, uh, I, I just like to hack them. <laughs> so this is how you do it in Spark. It, it's not that different, but I'll highlight the differences. Uh, so first, um, you can ignore the first part, the parallelize, which is loading data. Uh, but first, I'm taking the words, and I'm doing a map to this underscore comma one. I'm basically turning each word into a tuple, where I have the first part is the word, and the second part is the count of one. And then I'm going to do what is called a group by key, which is uh, I, I, the most common way to do grouping in Spark, where I take a tuple, and the first part of that is considered a key. And I'm going to put, uh, move all of the instances of that word uh, on the same node. Right? Um, then I'm going to convert uh, this, uh, this tuple of the word and all the instances into a count, like before, and I'm going to sort it and do a tick. Um, it's roughly similar, you know, just uh, slightly different with the group by key. Uh, this is a little bit hard to see because of the color flip, but uh, what is actually happening is that, um, so the first stage is a map from the word to the tuple, where you see apple comma one. Then we do a network, a distributed shuffle with the group by, where all the instances of apple, for example, appear on the same node. Then we're doing a sort because we want to know what the top items are. So we're sorting by the second parameter, which is another network shuffle. Then we finally take, use the tick to take the first items. Can we do better, though? And the answer is uh, yes. Oh, actually, so before that, um, just to highlight, you can't see the colors, but um, all the boxes on, on the left are happening on the worker node. And only when you get the results using tick does it transfer to the driver. So can we do better uh, than the first method? The answer is yes. So uh, what, what we do this time um, is that we use a method called top, which Spark has specifically for doing this kind of thing. Top avoids the global sorting of items uh, by taking the top item, K items from each node and, and then combining them at the driver. And the reason why you can do this for a top distributed top K is because um, you can do this because the items are unique on each node. If they weren't unique, you wouldn't be able to use this technique because it would, you, would, you can't guarantee that you would be able to get um, the uh, top K items um, if they're duplicates. And there is a, there's a function called a reduce by key, which is basically a group by key plus a local reduce, which is pretty convenient. Now let's move to another application uh, of um, of Spark, which is uh, ETL. So let's say that I want to read uh, a um, whole bunch of lines from. So this is one of our data sets. It's uh, called Chicago Crimes data. Uh, my coworkers are probably rolling their eyes. Um, so let's say we want to extract a few fields, uh, filter by the date, and you know take a couple items. So this is you know pretty similar to the examples we've seen before. We're splitting the input line. Um, mapping it into a tuple, uh, et cetera, et cetera. What if you have a huge file? Well, we can try parallelizing it. So we take this, so let's say you break up the file into multiple chunks, and you can do one to four dot par. This gives me a, dis a parallel a collection of numbers, and I'm gonna flat map that into like uh, IL dot source. Uh, let me, I can try scrolling this a little bit. Um, <laughs> Well, the, all this is just, yeah, so this is, this is just taking IO.source stuff from file.get lines and um, converting that into, uh, into one big stream, but this is still done in parallel. Um, so this is cool. This helps, uh, this helps it be a little faster. Let's say that my data is really big. It's in like the, in the gigabytes. So let's do this in Spark. Let's say that I load my data into S3 or HDFS. I can use the text file method of Spark Context to pass it a URL. This is a, that's a local one, but if it was HDFS, it would probably, be, you know, uh, if you had HDFS enabled, it would, um, this would look into HDFS at that path. Uh, or you can preface it with S3 for S3 bucket or whatever. Um, and the rest of the code is actually exactly the same as, as my Scala local example. Um, all four lines, the map, filter, and the tick is exactly the same, which is pretty cool. Now I have distributed ETL. 
and the only change is how I input my code. Uh, one note that I'll make is that uh, if, if let's say that you want to read from data source that is not Hadoop or S3 or whatever, let's say you want to read from Mongo or whatever, right? Um, then I can use this technique of doing uh, parallelize and loading a list of, for example, um, keys in Mongo, and then I can go and read those documents out and process them in parallel. So it's really similar, um, just that you don't have a built-in function called text file. What about side effects? So far, we've been talking a lot about transformations. Uh, let's say that I want to write the, my transform data out to a database, right? So then that's where the for each comes in. I can do my rdd.foreach, and that takes each data piece of data and writes it to a database. There's a similar method that allow you to iterate over all the items in a partition if you want more efficient. Let's say I want to write all the items in one partition to, uh, to disk at once, you can do that too. <coughs> so pretty cool so far we talked about, we take a Scala collection, we can, you know, you know how to do it locally, and with very little effort, we see we can apply that to batch style computations uh, in Spark. I'm going to talk about Spark streaming a little bit because you'll find out you can use a very similar API um, and apply to streaming data, which is pretty cool. Spark streaming is um, Spark, but running on streams of data, and it applies micro batches. So it divides, it splits up the input stream into very small um, bits of data, let's say one second's worth, or you can control what that interval is. And it runs a, a little Spark execution on those little batches, and you can write it to different data sources. So just to give you a flavor of what that looks like, um, Nick's speaker, Helena, will go into this in a lot more depth. Um, I have an SSC, which is Spark streaming context. And I'm going to read a bunch of, this is again the word count example that we, we know and love. We're going to read it from a socket. I'm going to take the lines, and uh, which is a called a D stream uh, for distributed stream. And I'm going to apply a flat map over it and split each line into words. So now I got a stream of words. And then I'm going to apply the map function again. That and there's that thing that you are really familiar with by now, like uh, converting the word into a tuple of the word and a count. And I'm gonna do this reduce by key that you've also seen. So this is pretty much the same code as the batch example, but now I'm applying it to streams of data. And one thing to think about is that um, what does a, the reduce by key is really a group by, right? What does the group by mean on a stream, right? If, if I just had a Scala iterator over lines of text and I applied group by, that wouldn't really work in a streaming uh, fashion, or it, it would be like, it, it's, re it's really unclear what that means, right? Because typically, like, in order to do group by, you need to know the whole set of data. Uh, but in this case, it is, uh, just, it's pretty easy to understand. It is doing the group by on each chunk of input data and, uh, and writing it out. Uh, so a couple tips on, on Spark. Uh, definitely play around with the REPL. This is a really, really great way to get started. Uh, just like you might have played with the REPL in Scala to get started, you can do the same thing in Spark. It makes it very easy to explore. Remember that transformations are lazy. This gets everyone who's doing Spark. They will be writing a bunch of code, and they'll be wondering how come nothing ever happens. Um, you want to limit the number of expensive grouping and sorting operations. Definitely explore the many subcomponents. Uh, yeah. I'm wondering, um, so I, I assume the REPL is, is not the standard REPL. It's a REPL partic uh, particular to Spark. It's a modified, you know, uh, standard Scala REPL. Right, so it's, it's not just adding the library to the class class, basically. It's doing other stuff. What other stuff should there? Um, as far as I know, I've actually looked in the source code for that before, but details are a little fuzzy. Um, I know it tries to make sure that the code that you have is actually properly serialized like um, to uh, the remote destination. Um, so I know there's some class loader stuff in there. I don't remember what else. But to be honest, I've been able to get um, 
what I do sometimes is, so, so I have a separate project called the Spark Job Server, which provides a REST interface. And a lot of times, inst in instead of loading the um, building Spark, which takes a long time, and uh, launching Spark Shell locally, I will actually launch SPT console from one of my other projects that pulls in Spark as a dependency. And you can actually do the same stuff using SPT console. So it's, it's actually pretty easy. The only thing is that you need to create the Spark conductor yourself, whereas the Spark Shell will create it for you. It's, a, it's not a big deal. That's just a few lines of code. It's a few, yeah. Or you can even put it into SVD config as a, uh, I don't know, there's something where you can tell it to execute things at the beginning of the show. I will definitely explore the many some components, Spark streaming, MLlib, GraphX, Spark SQL, because one of the coolest things about Spark, and I think what makes it unique is that in the old days, if you, let's say that you have Hadoop, you run a map of your job, then you have to run another tool, let's say Maho, to do machine learning. Right, so which is another set of tools. You might do some conversion, and this is more things to manage. In Spark, you can, I can seamlessly, uh, I can load data in, run some Scala API, run S, uh, Spark SQL, take the results of that, uh, you know, run, uh, apply logistic regression to it. it. It's very seamless, which is, I think, very, very powerful. Um, will definitely take time to understand caching because it has a huge impact on your performance as well as your design for uh, resiliency and this kind of thing. And I will definitely check out the many integrations that makes your lives much easier. There's the Spark Cassandra connector, connecting Cassandra. There's an Elasticsearch connector, and I think that people are writing all sorts of different connectors for whatever their thing is. Um, so in conclusion, if you can flat map it, then you can spark it. So go try it. <laughs> Actually, hold on one second. Do I have, do I have a minute for a demo? Couple minutes. Uh, cool. So let's let's see if this color thing will work or not. Um, uh, this is well. Okay. I don't really know if this will work, but um, oh, okay. Hold on for one minute. Uh, I'll have to blow this up a lot to make this work. Oh. No, that's the wrong one. Oh, I can't really see my cursor. All right, cool. Is that kind of readable? Yeah. Hmm? Oh, it's too low. Well, okay, all right. Here, how about that? <laughs> um, <laughs> All right, all right, all right. We'll, uh, we'll move this. Okay, there we go. Yeah, all right. So everyone can see this. Uh, basically what I've done is, this is this is basically the example that I had on the screen before. I've taken a text file that I have and um, done a bunch of maps and filters and detail operations. And you see what I get is that I get a mapped RDD, which is again, um, that it is lazy. This doesn't do anything, right? So uh, now uh, what I do is I do res zero, uh, let's say that I want to count the number of distinct prime types. So I do distinct, and I have to do a collect. Without the collect, it won't actually execute. So now what it does is it reads from disk, and it does the processing, and it's doing this in local mode, which is a bunch of different threads. And I, I see the, the um, you know, depressing list of prime types. Um, this takes about 6.5 seconds, which is cool. But let's see what effect caching has. So, in, in, so instead of just, so what happens if you run this again is that this is going to read from disk again. So this is again going to take about, well, this took a little faster, but it, it, it will like, you know, it, it will take a bit longer. But let's say that I cache the results. So now I have a cached RDD, res3, and I do a distinct dot collect. The first time it will still take a while because it has to do the computation from disk, but then it's going to cache uh, the result of the last step uh, in memory as it's doing so. Uh, so again, this takes three seconds. But if I was to run this again, you see that this is almost instant. This is 0.1 seconds. So this is like you know 30 times faster, right? Um, and if I keep doing this, it, it is instant, right? So, so you see that now it is reading uh, data from the cache instead of from disk. And right. can, you, can you compose those cache 
things and, and add a, another calculation to the end of something that was cached? Yeah, so I can, I can do like rest three dot, I mean, let's say that I want to, uh, I don't know, let's say I want to map, uh, I don't know, let's say that I want to add a bracket to the thing or something, something weird. Uh, I can't think of a better example right now, and I do collect, and, you know, yeah. So, so I can do that, and it will be equally fast. Basically, you can think of the cache as a point from which I can, like, add branches of a tree, and, and all those branches will execute, you know, pretty fast. So, anything else you want to do? <laughs> Yeah, I, so you definitely have to watch um, your memory usage. You, you can definitely blow up the heap uh, pretty easily. Um, Spark does give you an API for assessing your memory usage, though. Um, so you can use it to assess how much free space you have and you know that kind of thing. But, yeah, so you can unpersist. I can unpersist my data. Um, I think there's a unpersist, I think. Uh, well, okay, I don't quite remember what it is, but there, there's, there's some method that you can use to, to free your, your uh, maybe it's uncached. Oh, this is a, this is a method that's just missing out here. Yeah, I, I, don't quite, I don't quite remember what it is, but. Yeah, uh, any other, well, if you guys have any other questions, uh, I'd be happy to take, um, yeah, questions in the back, so. Yep. Cool.